Hey everybody, welcome back to the Study Tube Project. Today you are back with me, Rosie, and we are gonna continue learning about one of my favorite areas of archeology, span bioarchaeology. In today's video, I am going to be discussing dietary isotopes, and hopefully by the end of the video, you will have learned just why we really are what we eat. The leg bone's connected to the knee bone, the knee bone's connected to the thigh bone, the thigh bone's connected to the hip bone, now shake them skeleton bones, woo! I'm going to close the window. Next door I've got people over. Next door I've got people over. How are we ever going to get through this if people keep ignoring what we're supposed to do? Stay in your own home. Almost all chemical elements have more than one possible atomic weight and it is these different atomic variations that we call isotopes. These isotopes may be stable, like the ones we're discussing today, or unstable, such as carbon-14, which is what archaeologists can use to date organic materials that contain carbon. The two elements which we will be discussing in today's video are carbon and nitrogen and both of these elements can be used by archaeologists to help us look into the types of proteins and just generally the types of foods eaten. First of all we are going to be talking about carbon and more specifically the isotopes carbon-12 and carbon-13. Now when archaeologists are looking at the diets of animals and humans we look at the ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12 which is why I've written them this way around. I know it doesn't look logical, but the ratio is carbon-13 to 12. So how much carbon-13 there is for every carbon-12. And we write that little ratio like this. That is very much adequate. No, it really isn't. That's awful. I'm going to write that again. Do you know what that looks like? Dipsy off the tally tubbies. Does it? It does, doesn't it? Now different types of plants metabolise these carbon isotopes differently during photosynthesis and it's because they have different photosynthetic pathways. Before going any further into the archaeological side of things, I'm just going to explain what those pathways are because they are actually pretty important to the understanding of the isotope stuff. These pathways are known as the C3 and C4 pathways and they're dependent on climate. In short, once an animal eats the plants, it will then present a different carbon-13 to 12 ratio dependent on whether it is a C3 or C4 plant. So C3 plants make up approximately 95% of the Earth's natural biomass and are suited to cooler, wetter climates. During photosynthesis, metabolic fractionation occurs and the C13 is discriminated against. This means that the carbon-13 is more likely to be excreted, whereas the carbon-12 is more likely to be metabolised and remain within the organism in the burns. I'm pretty sure that this is because the carbon-12 is lighter as an isotope and therefore uses less energy to be metabolised, which essentially means broken down for fuel and for growth and to use within the tissues. What this does mean then is that C3 plants are more likely to produce a more negative carbon-13 to 12 ratio. And this is because there is less of it remaining in the body than the carbon-12. So when analysing the carbon isotopes in bones of animals who have eaten the C3 plants, we're looking at a ratio value of between minus 30 and minus 20 parts per mil. Now this little weird percentagey looking thing means parts per mil, it essentially means parts per thousand, but mil is the French word for thousand. C4 plants on the other hand are suited to hot and dry climates. And because they discriminate less against carbon-13, they have much higher carbon-13 to 12 ratio values. Usually C4 plants generate a carbon-13 to 12 ratio value of between minus 12 and minus 13, but a lot of the time it's a mixed diet, so you'd get signatures of more around minus 15, minus 16, because there's only 5% only of the Earth's natural biomass is C4, so chances are there is a bit of a mix in the diet, especially because a lot of the meat that people will be eating, the animals will not have just been eating C4 plants. Much of the basic crop in Northern and Central America is C4 plants, 
and because of that you can actually tell quite often from a skeleton that it is probably from North America obviously we need to look at other aspects of the archaeological record as well using diet as a proxy if someone shows high levels of C4 plants they might come from America particularly because of the use of cornstarch compared to elsewhere Europe doesn't really use cornstarch but again it's just a proxy and we need to use other things to help us with that as well there is also difference in the carbon 13 to 12 ratio values between ocean and land plants in the ocean the amount of C13 is higher so ocean plants have a more positive carbon 13 to 12 ratio value than in land and freshwater plants. This can then help decipher between freshwater and marine fish that have been eaten. Essentially as animals eat the plants the different ratios from the different pathways are passed along the food chain and are eventually fixed into animal and then human bone tissue. So in order to assess the carbon 13 to 12 ratios we have to either analyse collagen or bioappetite. Bone collagen is a fibrous structural protein constituting about 90% of the bone's organic content and is the most common protein in the body. Collagen is stiffened in mature bones due to the dense infilling of the bone's second component, bioappetite or hydroxyapatite. These bits of the bone become a sort of sealed capsule because the isotope value that they give represents the time of formation. Adult bones remodel every 10 to 20 years. So for example, if I ate C3 plants my whole life up until the age of 35, so always ate lettuce, cabbage, carrots, and then at 35 years old I started eating only corn and maize which are C4 plants, then died at 40, we likely would not see those last five years of my life, we would just think I'd always eaten C3 plants, which might confuse people. Say I moved to America for the last five years of my life and then started eating a lot of cornstarch. They, if archaeologists didn't know, that I had lived there for five years, they might think that I was literally on a holiday because all my diet showed was kind of a European diet and not an American diet, if that makes sense. So it does have its limitations and we have to use other aspects of archaeology to back up evidence. So other evidence that I might have lived there for five years include having a home or being on census records. We can also look at the isotopes of nitrogen to learn about the diet too. So the two stable isotopes of nitrogen that we look at are nitrogen-14 and nitrogen-15. And in order to look at the different types of protein consumed, we look at the ratio of nitrogen-15 to nitrogen-14, which is written like this. Now the lighter and more common isotope of the two is nitrogen-14. And you can tell if an isotope is lighter or heavier by looking at the number next to the atomic letter. So nitrogen-14 is lower than nitrogen 15, meaning that nitrogen 15 is heavier. So because nitrogen 15 is heavier, it's discriminated against during meta 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 metabolism. What this means is that when proteins are digested, it takes more energy to metabolize or digest the nitrogen 15 than it does the nitrogen 14. Because of this, it remains in the body in the bones and the collagen. Because nitrogen-14 is lighter, it's metabolised more easily and is excreted. Interestingly, as you go up the food chain, e.g. from rabbit to fox or from cow to human, the amount of nitrogen-15 increases by about 3 to 5 parts per mil. There's a famous quote in dietary isotope studies taken from De Niro and Epstein 1976. You are what you eat plus a few per mil. So what this would mean is that you would have the same nitrogen 15 to 14 ratio as the thing you consumed plus 3 to 5 parts per mil for that extra trophic level. From that what we can already see is that any vegans or vegetarians out there are going to have a much lower nitrogen 15 to 14 ratio because there are much less trophic levels to go through before the food is being eaten as it is just going to be the plants. So another key point is that usually land animals have much shorter food chains before the top carnivore than aquatic food chains. So for example, you could have a food chain on land which might just simply be grass, sheep, human or grass, rabbit, fox. Whereas in the sea you could have a much longer food chain such as phytoplankton, krill, herring, mackerel, human. And because of that you would have much more jumps up the 3 to 5 parts per mil 
So consequently, humans or animals eating only land animals will have a much lower nitrogen 15 to 14 ratio than those eating only aquatic animals. Most modern human populations do, however, have quite a varied diet and therefore a great mix between land and sea and water animal food chains within their diet. Now I'm going to put a graph on the screen which has carbon on one side and nitrogen on the other, carbon at the bottom, nitrogen on the side, and it does make it much more easy to visualise what I'm talking about. So as you can see, people who only eat plants, so vegans, vegetarians, but vegans in particular will likely have the lowest carbon and nitrogen signatures so they'll be at the bottom of the graph unless they are only eating things like sweet corn and maize then they might be at the top but they'll still be on the low end of the nitrogen it increases with vegetarian because there'll be some animal projects projects <laughs> produce and therefore a little bit of animal protein which may take it up because of the extra trophic level then as you get into omnivores it'll be in the middle then here we can actually see on this graph a split between people who only eat fish, a group which hunts both, and a group which is only land animals. And this is from when it was like hunter-gatherer population. But it does present it in quite an easy to visualise way, I think, anyway. <laughs> now there is an exception to the fish rule. So that's shellfish, and a diet consisting of only shellfish, so like prawns, mussels, crab, may have a low nitrogen 15 ratio despite them being aquatic protein because they are both low in the food chain and also they're nitrogen fixing organisms so things like oysters, clams, other shellfish are efficient filter feeders and that helps to remove excess nitrogen from the waters because they incorporate it into their shells. Chances are that if at some point in your food chain there is fertilised vegetation then chances are it will mess up the sort of natural levels that we'd be looking for and that is because isotopic discrimination occurs. So the nitrogen 14 that is in the manure will evaporate off, whereas the nitrogen 15, because it's heavier, will get absorbed into the grass and be used as their protein to grow. So naturally then the grass will have a higher nitrogen 15 content and therefore even at the bottom of the food chain, without the extra trophic jumps, there'll be a higher nitrogen 15 to 14 ratio. What this could do then is create inconclusive or even falsely marine sort of level results. And there are of course other limitations to both isotopes, particularly carbon. One of those being the canopy effect and one of those being the routing issue. And both of those things are complex so I would rather put those in a reference and if you would like to go away and do extra research into those then you can. I'll put all of the references that you'd need for those in the pinned comment along with the references for the rest of the research but especially for the limitations I'm just gonna leave those because I don't want to make this video more complex or longer than it needs to be and anyway I hope you've learned a lot I hope you enjoyed this video I hope it was explained okay and I will see you in my next video. Don't forget to subscribe to the StudyTube project. And if you enjoyed listening to me, then subscribe to my channel. It is Rosie Crawford or Just A Little Roo. Either will work. My Instagram is Just A Little Roo, as is my TikTok and my Twitter. So if you enjoyed me, go and check it out. There's a lot more like study tips and motivation tips and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm done here. I'm done here.